Hello and welcome to Eastern Roman History. Today I'm joined by an illustrious guest. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself? For sure. I'm the Pharaoh Nerd, and today we're going to be discussing both ancient Egyptian and late Roman usurpers. Yes, I thought it would be a very interesting topic to cover, because when one talks about the history of Egypt or the Eastern Roman Empire, you know, you cover people like Heraclius and Justinian and Ramesses III, but very rarely do you have people that sort of cover the people that lost, the Magnus Magnentiuses of this world. So I thought it would be quite interesting if we could talk a little bit about some of our favourite and interesting usurpers from our two respective subjects. Yeah, I think there's a lot to cover. Definitely. I would go first with my usurpers. So we've both sure, chosen yeah. six or thereabouts, and we'll talk about a Roman one and then an Egyptian one. And I've tried to keep mine to late Roman because I think most of those are have the most interesting usurpers. I mean, you do get later ones, but it's very cut and dry. The period right before the fall of the Western Roman Empire is just a real hood. It's just, it's filled with so many bizarre and uh, astounding anecdotes. I mean, really yeah. amazing. And also quite a different uh, sort of the circumstances of usurpation changes quite a lot during the period. This is something I've been investigating, and it's interesting how at the start of the period, sort of after Constantine, you have uh, usurpers like Magnus Magnentius, who's very simple in that he wants to be emperor of the whole of the Roman Empire. And then by the end, you have the very bizarre situation where uh, Julius Nepos, who could certainly be counted as a usurper, is legitimate in the eyes of the East, and he is deposing the illegitimate Emperor Glycerius, so it gets a bit weird there. But yeah, so yeah, I thought sure. this would be a good opportunity to sort of talk a bit about that, and also Egyptian stuff. Yeah, I, uh, trust me, a lot of these people are going to be pretty obscure, but I promise you they provide a great story. And also, in addition, uh, like Rome, uh, late Roman usurpers, uh, even though Egyptian history is very static, uh, the nature of usurpation did also change over the thousands upon thousands of years of mm. Pharaonic history, too. There was that time when the governor Intef ends up rebelling, and you have a very steady usurpation over several decades and generations. Uh, he started his own line of uh, kings ruling in the south, opposing the sort of figurehead kings in Memphis, and eventually his... Uh, a distant descendant, Mentuhotep II, uh, conquered the north and reunited Egypt, ushering in a new glory age. But then his uh, grandson was then usurped, and that started one of the main components of the very glory age he founded, and then on, on and so on and so on. I think I'll start off with my first usurper, and I thought I would choose Carousius, the mm. emperor of Britain. So Carousius, or Marcus Aurelius Malsius Carousius, he was a Menapian uh, from Belgica, so he's uh, northern Gallic, and he was an admiral. So he was a skilled sailor and naval commander, and the Emperor Diocletian, who's only recently taken control of the whole of the Roman Empire after defeating his rival, the Emperor Carinus. Uh, he sends his friend Maximian, who he has uh, appointed as Caesar, to Gaul to deal with the Begaudi, uh, who are a organised bandit group. While he's there, he also has to deal with attacks along the Rhine, and also uh, Frankish and Saxon raids against Britain and along the English Channel. And oh yeah, I love Maximian. He was the strong man of the regime, right? He was uh, the enforcer of Diocletian's policies, right? Mm. 
that image is almost torn down slightly by Carousius because oh, every yeah. time Maximian tried to defeat him, Carousius came out the better. So that is but one man who could defeat Maximian, and that was Carousius. But uh, before we get to that, so Carousius was instructed to defeat the Frankish Saxon attacks, and he did so, and he successfully defeated uh, the barbarian naval raids, but he was accused of embezzling the plunder taken from the barbarians rather than returning it to the original owners, which meant that Carousius was uh, to be arrested and executed by by order of the Emperor Maximian, which leads to Carousius's revolt. And so Carousius, because he's already in charge of the navy, he goes off to Britain and he proclaims himself emperor. And for the next nine years, he controls all of Roman Britain and also parts of northern Gaul, uh, centred around mm. Boulogne. Because of that, it was going to be very difficult to defeat Carousius because he held both sides or large portions of both sides of the English Channel. And also Carousius was able to present himself as a as a threat in another way, not just militarily, but economically as well. So by this time, the Roman monetary system largely broken down. The This was because the coinage, the Antoninianus, had been debased into virtual worthlessness. Mm, uh, yeah. It was a silver coin which looked very bronze. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, and so Carousius, he made himself very popular by minting lots of denarii, which had been revalued, a much heavier, much larger silver content, which meant that eh, all the people who was minting that money for, you didn't have the problems of higher prices and in, uh, inflation in Britain and areas under Carousius' control. That's sort of sim similar to Posthumus, right? Since he controlled uh, Hispania, he was able to mint these really high-quality mm. silver coins, right? When At he first he was, yes. Yeah, yeah, and then they sort of fell off. Uh, by the end, under Tra Tetricus, the Gallic Empire was so battered by various attacks that their yeah. coins, the coins they were minting were even wor more worthless than the ones that Aurelian was. Yeah, I have a pitiful little uh, bronze, like almost completely bronze Antoninianus of Tetricus II. It's mm. uh, quite interesting. One of the main things why I like Carousius, and I think he is one of the most fascinating characters of Roman history. One, because he was the British Emperor, and yeah, being an Englishman course. myself, I have a certain pride, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but, but also he was incredibly successful. He, as I said, by uh, storm or by naval ability, he was able to defeat Maximian. And it was only once uh, Constantius I came along that Carousius' regime started to unravel in the 290s, which is actually the loss of Boulogne to Constantius is what causes his death. So as I say, he was economically sound. He is believed to have helped develop the Saxon shore forts running along the English coastline. And also he was eventually recognised... Not officially, but the Diocletian and Maximian made peace with Carousius, which Carousius oh. then sort of promoted as, aha, a colleague of my mate Diocletian and Maximian. Right, so, he's a fifth patriarch, eh? Yeah. Um, so he almost got away with it too. Uh, <laughs> it's like you very rarely see someone like that as well. I mean, mm -hmm. as you say, Posthumus is probably someone who could be quite similar uh, maybe also Magnus Maximus and Constantine III, but Carousius seems to have been a bit more both militarily sound and also been able to make a viable alternative that was a big threat to the Tetrarchy for the nine years he was emperor. I, I heard Carousius himself was sort of usurped, or what was the deal with uh, Electus, his treasurer? Ah, so what happened was... Constantius I led an army to Boulogne and captured the city. And from this defeat, uh, Carousius' reputation was really took a, 
big blow. Electus, there seems to be some evidence that maybe Electus was already plotting against him, so Carousius was out for his blood. There is rumour that Electus was negotiating with the Tetrarchs. Hmm, really? Perhaps what evidence is that? Eutropius? Oh, Something interesting. Something like that. He attempted to negotiate with the Tetrarchs, and then the historian Casey, who wrote a book about Carousius and Electus, was saying that it may have been a disagreement over policy. So Carousius had made peace and seems to have wanted to just stay in Britain, whereas maybe Electus wanted to try and be a bit more aggressive. It's very difficult to tell because the sources for this are very meagre anyway and yeah, I can relate. very There's... skew towards the victors in this conflict. Yeah, for sure. That's the exact same with Egypt. Yeah, Electus managed to assassinate Carousius and then took over as British emperor a few years before Constantius invaded Britain with his Praetorian prefect and uh, defeated him and brought Britain back into the fold. Yeah, there's a lovely uh, a medallion uh, commemorating that, right? Mm. It shows uh, Constantius crossing the Thames or something. He's on a horse and he's walking off a ship and London. Oh, yeah. There's a personification of London sort of offering grace to him. He's uh, nice. the liberator. Yeah, that's something I'd for sure want in my collection. So, who is your first usurper? My first usurper is a guy by the name of Usurkare, whose name translates to powerful as the Ka of Ra, the soul of the sun god. And he reigned from anywhere between one and five years, depending on which Egyptologist you ask, during the late 24th or early 23rd centuries BC, which is at the beginning of some of a period called the Sixth Dynasty, uh, which was the final dynasty of the Old Kingdom, Egypt's first Golden Age, which produced things like the Pyramids of Giza and other marvels. His relation to his predecessor, Teddy, the founder of the Sixth Dynasty, is unclear. Uh, but he, Usurkare, our guy, may have had maybe a bit of a a negative relationship with him. According to the Egyptiaca, a Ptolemaic history of Egypt written by a native Egyptian priest named Manetho, uh, Teddy was murdered either by his bodyguards or his attendants, and Usurkare may very well have had a part in that. Although we should take this claim with a grain of salt, given that it was made two millennia after Teddy uh, had died, but we don't really have any better sources since the uh, ancient Egyptians weren't really keen on writing their history down like the Romans. And also there's some extra problems with Menetho as well, because we don't actually have the uh, actual full text of his Egyptica. It's sort of yeah. pieced together from references from elsewhere, yeah. like George's the Sincelos, Eusebius's Chronicle, and stuff like that. So It's uh, very tricky, but unfortunately it's uh, our only source on, uh, our only explicit source on the death of Teddy, but other more contemporary evidence uh, does demonstrate to us that Usurkare may very well have been involved with uh, Teddy's murder, and it's very possible that he's the earliest known usurper in world history. I'm going to be honest, I didn't really <laughs> investigate this claim, but, you know, 24th century BC, that's far back enough, right? Mm. Uh, so, oddly enough, certain high officio officials who served both Teddy and Pepe I, Usurkare's successor, don't mention serving Usurkare in the in their tombs, despite having been alive and presumably active during his reign. Uh, in one tomb of the period, that of a guard named Mehi, the name of Teddy was actually erased and replaced with another king's, king's name, only for that king's name to then be erased and replaced with Teddy's again. This suggests that this guy, Mehi, may have been one of Usurkare's backers, which of course backfired on him politically since work on his tomb was stopped abruptly at some point and he likely never enjoyed being buried in it. But it's also possible that Usurkare wasn't a usurper at all. It's There's a lot of 
you see, debates. ancient Egyptian history is mainly a mystery, you know? Yeah. There's no real concrete facts since uh, there's so little evidence, right? But we can piece a story together. Usukari's fully legitimate successor, Pepi I, had an approximately half century long reign, which as I'm sure you know is pretty unprecedented in the ancient world, and as such may have been very young upon Teddy's demise, and Usurkare may have just been a stopgap ruler or some sort of regent along with Pepi's mother Iput, a daughter of the last pharaoh of the previous 5th dynasty. But this theory is itself undermined by the fact that Usurkare appears on something called the Abydos King List, and may have been mentioned on various other king lists, which were all reserved for actual full-fledged pharaohs. Countering that, however, and suggesting that uh, Usurkare was actually a le legitimate ruler is the fact that he's even included on such king lists. Because if you were a pharaoh deemed illegitimate by your successors, you would experience complete damnatio memoria, like so many Roman emperors, right? Their exactly. memories were completely expunged. And all testaments of your reign that could be discovered anywhere were destroyed and usurped. Uh, I think Usurkare is a really interesting case of how the vast majority of knowledge of the political history of ancient Egypt comes from something as simple as the context in which the names of pharaohs are found, unlike most Roman emperors who are documented by actual historical texts, right? Although you could argue that that doesn't really apply to some of the more poorly documented emperors and usurpers. There are other mediums as well to help us out for yeah, fairly unknown like coins, emperors, right? like coins, inscriptions, like Carousius. There's a milestone from Britain which... Yeah has sort of York 10 miles away, and Krausius is great. That's a funny yeah, one, because sure. someone picked it up, and this is a good example of Damnatio Memoriae for the Romans, someone picked up that milestone, crossed out his name, flipped it over, and then put Constantius I's name on the other end, and then put <laughs> it back in the ground. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh... But uh, if Usurkare wasn't obviously related to his predecessor, that begs the question, who was he, right? Well, it's very possible, whether he was a usurper or not, that he was actually a scion of the 5th dynasty, which had ended by this point. And one theory suggests, given that Usurkare's name incorporates the name of the sun god, like the members of the preceding 5th dynasty, Usurkare was a member of said dynasty and actually seized power from the burgeoning 6th. Given that Pepi I's mother was also a descendant of this dynasty, I personally think that if this theory was actually true, he may not have acted alone, right? Rise. Either way, a pharaoh has got to have a tomb. And although Usukare isn't well attested elsewhere, a lot of obscure pharaohs are very well attested by their own tombs. But unfortunately, we don't have his tomb yet. We do know that it was probably a pyramid, given that nearly every pharaoh of the Old Kingdom built themselves one, and given how short Usurkare's reign was, it was probably unfinished by the time he kicked the bucket. It has been hypothesized that Usurkare's pyramid may lie amongst an assortment of six dynasty tombs northwest of his successor Pepi's pyramid, and this area is called Tabet al Guesh, and it's within the larger necropolis of Saqqara, which served the grand ancient capital of Egypt, Memphis. Uh, but Unfortunately, to this day, uh, Egyptologists are still digging in the sand in Saqqara trying to uncover this unfinished pyramid. Although it hasn't brought, been brought to light yet, we're really hoping it's going to come to light uh, sometime soon. Well, hopefully. Oh, and that's the other thing. Maybe he did start building a pyramid, if he had time to, and then what better way to erase him from history than steal his tomb and make it into one of your own. Yeah, that's definitely a possibility, and if he wasn't actually a legitimate ruler, then he definitely would have been tossed out, you know, and yeah. wouldn't have been granted a proper burial. You know, maybe when it's found, it won't have Usurkari's name on it, but someone else's. Who knows? 